trial in British legal history. If it was alleged that someone had died as a result of eating a McDonald's hamburger, that would be investigated, would it? I'm sure it would, yes. So if people said McDonald's food is junk food? It is not junk food in my book. What is objected to in this leaflet is not the suggestion that McDonald's is junk food, but that it kills its customers. Cancer. Off. Oh, Court number 35, the Royal Courts of Justice in the Strand in London. For almost three years, the scene of a David and Goliath battle between one of the world's biggest corporations and two London anarchists. The corporation is McDonald's, who are suing Helen Steele and Dave Morris for libel over claims in this leaflet, published by London Greenpeace, which should not be confused with Greenpeace International. The leaflet claims that McDonald's have tortured animals reared for slaughter, destroyed rainforests to raise beef, caused food poisoning, exploited their staff, exploited children by advertising, and worst of all, sold food linked with heart disease and cancer. McDonald's are represented in court by Richard Rampton QC. And since there's no legal aid available for libel cases, Morris and Steele must defend themselves. The judge, Mr Justice Lord, Bell, rise. was appointed a High Court judge in 1993 and was then almost immediately given charge of this trial. This is the first time he's presided over libel case. Richard Rampton is one of the country's top libel barristers who was featured in many headline-grabbing libel cases, including the action brought by soap star Gillian Tailforth against the News of the World. His fee is said to be £2,000 a day. Dave Morris is an unemployed postman who, as a single parent with a young child, gets income support of £76.50 a week. Helen Steele is a former gardener who, during the trial, works weekends behind the bar in a nightclub for £64 a week. The trial is a clash of two cultures, a battle of jeans and jumpers against wigs and gowns. Originally estimated to take four to six weeks, the court will now hear evidence for a record-breaking 313 days, making it the longest trial in English legal history. Oberon War, columnist son of the famous novelist Evelyn War, calls the trial the best free entertainment in town. It's easy to see what he means. There's the homespun corporate philosophy of the American senior vice president of McDonald's, Robert McKinley Beavers. I've used the phrase before, and it has to do with McDonald's culture. The business is almost magical to some of us. I mean, in the sense that you feel so motivated, so involved in working with different aspects of McDonald's that we have often used the phrase, many of us old timers. And I characterize myself, my lord, as an old timer. That is, if you were to cut us, you know, we would probably... Bleed ketchup. Bleed ketchup, yes. Yeah. Apart from spoiling Mr. Beaver's punchline, during the course of this marathon hearing, Helen Steele will often cross swords with Mr. Rampton as well. I should have had notice of this. The defendants have had a whole week in which to give me notice, and they haven't done it. it makes me very angry. Very funny, I know, for the defendants, because they're not spending any money in this case, but my clients are. We're just spending our whole lives, thank you very much, Mr. Rampton. And Dave Morris has his own way of objecting to Mr. Rampton. Lord, I'm trying to listen to the witness. The witness is giving his answer to the question. Can I hear the answer? Lord, I am making an objection. And I'm making an objection to Mr. Rampton making no, an objection. No, no. You can't do that. Then, as the trial reached the halfway stage, with the end nowhere yet in sight, Mr. Justice Bell will try to encourage the defendants to be more realistic about their expectations. It's no use saying that you want the truth to come out, because <clears throat> justice, it, it, it's not an absolute concept. It involves <clears throat> all sorts of things, like um, getting litigation over reasonably promptly and, and uh, one party or the other not being put to unnecessary expense. Things like that. It won't be until next month, almost three years after the trial started in June 1994, that Mr Justice Bell will finally deliver his judgment. This is the extraordinary story of that trial. Tonight and tomorrow we present reconstructions of its key stages. What you hear is exactly what happened. We begin with the opening speeches. 
This action, as your Lordship knows, is a libel action. The plaintiffs sue on a leaflet entitled, What's Wrong with McDonald's? Everything They Don't Want You to Know, which the plaintiffs assert contains numerous statements which are highly defamatory and false in every material respect, and which the defendants distributed on various occasions in late 1989 and early 1990. The plaintiffs resolve they must try to put a stop to it and instructed two firms of inquiry agents to investigate the matter. Employees of these two firms attended meetings of the London Greenpeace Group and found it to be a group of people whose view of the world was, to use their own words, anarchist, and whose principal objective appeared to be the destruction or dismantling of organized society as we know it, and in particular of capitalism. The investigators found David Morris and Helen Steele to be leading lights in the group. The, the man given the task of hiring the two firms of inquiry agents to infiltrate London Greenpeace was Vice President of McDonald's, Sid Nicholson. He'll be giving evidence later in the trial, but for now he watched from the courtroom seat he occupied throughout the whole of the trial, his office, he called it, as Helen Steele and Dave Morris delivered their opening speeches. There's one word to sum up what this case is about, and that word is censorship. McDonald's are using the libel laws of this country to censor and silence their critics. This didn't start with our case. They threatened numerous other organisations and individuals with legal action for criticising their practices. And many who have apologised did so because of the huge difficulties in fighting a libel case, not because they believed they'd libelled McDonald's. They brought this case expecting that we too would cave in, apologise and therefore be silenced. We did not and we will not. On that side, we have McDonald's with an annual turnover of $24 billion. On this side, we have two unwaged members of the public, but not only us on this side, also the people they exploit. They exploit consumers, they exploit staff workers, they exploit children with advertising, they exploit animals, and they exploit the environment. In this case, there is no jury. We are asking you, the judge, and the public as a whole, to be our jury. The fact that there is no jury is a sore point for Morris and Steele. They wanted one, but this request was rejected by Mr Justice Bell and the Court of Appeal on the grounds that a jury of ordinary people would have difficulty understanding complicated scientific evidence. We'll be hearing some of that evidence later. But among the first topics to be examined was that of advertising. And the first witness was Mr. Paul Preston. ...shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <coughs> Mr. Preston, are your full names Paul Preston? Paul Stephen Preston, yes. Mr. Preston, may we detect you are an American by origin? I am. Are you the President and Chief Executive Officer of McDonald's Restaurants Limited, the United Kingdom subsidiary of McDonald's Corporation in Illinois. I am. Can we deduce from that that you are what we might facetiously call the Big Mac in this country? Yes, I am, and I'm proud of it. Mr. President, your company has brought this action on that leaflet. Do you recognize it? I do. This is an enlarged facsimile of the original. Have you considered the contents of that leaflet? I have. May I pass up, my lad, a copy in the same form? Mr. President, I want to ask you about some assertions that are made in the course of this leaflet. Notice the heading, uh, McDisease, McDeadly, and then the question at the top of the page, uh, beside the blob. What's so unhealthy about McDonald's food? So far as you're concerned, Mr. Preston, is McDonald's food unhealthy? It's perfectly healthy. I eat it all the time. Do you have a family, Mr. Preston? I do, two daughters and a wife. Do they eat it as well? They do. Do you encourage them to eat it? I take them on many occasions alongside me. Now, the next big subheading. How do McDonald's deliberately exploit children? Mr. Preston, do McDonald's deliberately exploit children? Absolutely not. Only one question in this column. It says that nearly all your advertising is aimed at children. Is that true or false? It's not true. Now, if we can cross over to the next column. 
Not a lot of children are interested in nutrition, and even if they were, all the gimmicks and routines with paper hats and straws and balloons hide the fact that the food they're seduced into eating is at best mediocre, at worst poisonous. Do you know of any evidence, Mr. Preston, that your food is poisonous to children? No. In this country, is the advertising which is produced for children governed by any kind of independent or other regulation? Oh, yes. Does your company have a concern to keep to the standards which are set by those authorities or not? Not only do we keep to their standards, but we have our own code of practice which is even more strict than their own. Which is called? The McDonald's Golden Arches Code. This may sound a silly question, but what is the purpose of Ronald McDonald? He's a spokesman to children. For what reason? As an advertising symbol. He's a character that has become known and loved with children on many fronts, in an educational sense. Synonymous with McDonald's, the food, the fun involved. Do you not consider it a cynical exploitation of children to use Ronald McDonald, a well-known clown, to drum up business for your company? No. Around the world in 30 seconds. And the great McDonald's balloon race is off. And it's Ronald and the Fry Guys. When the chief marketing officer of McDonald's, John Hawkes, was called to give evidence, 30 television commercials were played back in the courtroom, some aimed at adults and some featuring Ronald McDonald aimed at children. Mr. Rampton questioned John Hawkes about these commercials. In advertising for children, we don't sell in a direct way. We don't therefore show too much of the relationship between the characters and the food and selling the food. We use the advertising to entertain them. It makes them feel that McDonald's is a fun, colourful place that they would like to go to. That being so, what do you expect or hope will happen next? Well, we would hope that when the adult is eating out, or intends to eat out, the child will ask them to go to McDonald's. Can I ask you a little bit about uh, Ronald McDonald himself? Do you have any disquiet about the use of Ronald? Uh, he has some mates, uh, doesn't he? Um, Hamburglar and other people. Yes. The use of those characters to enhance your sale through the effect of those characters on children? No, none at all. Would you like to expand on that? Well, two main reasons. One, we do nothing and have no personality traits within those characters that could pose a problem to the growing up of children. So there's no ethical problem so far as that is concerned. And secondly, the child does not make the overriding decision to visit the restaurant. The parent does that. The parent always reserves the right to say no to the child. The defendants then called Susan Dibb of the National Food Alliance to give evidence about advertising to children on television. One of the themes that some of McDonald's advertisements use is that of being socially accepted. Can you explain a bit more about that then, please? Yes. Children need and want to be accepted to belong to a group. Are you saying there's anything particularly wrong with these methods? I think there are two issues here. There is the issue of if a food is deemed unhealthy, then to what extent should it be promoted to a child? Uh, are there other things? Yes, the adverts that use collectibles. Kids do love to collect things, and McDonald's have recognized this, and with their happy meals, they provide a range of collectibles. These include little mermaid figures, Barbie dolls, sports buddies, McRobots. With each of these, there are typically four to collect, one a week. So what are the concerns about that then? Well, certainly if a parent has taken their child one week, the chances are the child will want to go back the next three weeks to collect the full set. Um, I don't know if there was anything you wanted to say about Ronald McDonald, for example. If not, was there anything you wanted to say about any of the other characters that are used? Yes, I was going to refer to the character Hamburglar. The main purpose of Hamburglar in life is the acquisition of hamburgers. He isn't above borrowing them without a thought of payment. Mm. In fact, nobody expects payment. So the uh, problem is likely to be that children will copy his behaviour? They may copy his behaviour, and to that extent I don't think Hamburglar is a responsible character. Your National Food Alliance publication discussion paper, as you're pleased to call it, is headed, Children, Advertisers Dream Nutrition Nightmare. It's way over the top, isn't it? It has a question mark at the end. You see, this paper of yours, you're coming, as I understand, the totality of your evidence so far. Uh, you will correct me if I've misunderstood it. From this place, Miss Dip, 
Are you not? That it's wrong to persuade anybody to eat anything that cannot be described as healthy food. No, I have not said that. The focus is on children, as I've said before, because of the importance of diet during childhood. And also the fact that children do not, as we have pointed out, have the same abilities to assess what may or may not be in their best interest. Is that, is, that, is that really the key to your view? The children, they may be attracted to something by an advertisement. They, they have the facility to be strongly attracted without the uh, balancing facility to realise what might be adverse to their interests in the product. Is that what it boils down to? Yes. And so too the most serious libel that McDonald's alleged against the defendants. When Paul Preston, the British in Big Mac, house, first gave evidence, Mr. Rampton asked McDonald's him about claims concerning not. nutrition, diet and disease. Uh, can we go back to this part of the leaflet, please, Mr. Preston? It says, what they, uh, that is McDonald's, don't make clear, is that a diet high in fat, sugar, animal products and salt, sodium, in case anyone didn't know, and low in fibre, vitamins and minerals, which describes an average McDonald's meal. Pausing that, does that? Do you feel adequately describe an average McDonald's meal? It does not. Goes on. Is linked with cancers of the breast and bowel and heart disease. This is accepted medical fact and not a cranky theory. Mr Preston, may I ask you this? Do you have a concern, as head of a very large food service organisation in this country, that the food you are selling to your customers may be causing them heart disease, cancer and diabetes? I do not. Why is that? The food we sell is made from beef, bread, milk, potatoes, chicken, eggs, lettuce, orange juice, mineral water. I find those commodities in every household I've ever visited. Eaten as part of a balanced diet, they're perfectly safe, perfectly healthy. Has McDonald's ever published anything which contained lies? Certainly not knowingly. You wouldn't publish anything which you considered to be inaccurate? Not knowingly. Right, OK. Could you get volume 6, section A? Whereabouts? Number 4. Good Food Nutrition, McDonald's? Could you turn to page 12 of the document? Yes. Can you read the second paragraph on that page? There is a considerable amount of evidence to suggest that many of the diseases which are more common in the Western world, diseases such as obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, and some forms of cancer, are related to diet. Thank you. Do you feel happy that McDonald's published this document? Yes. I think for its time, uh, October 84, ten years ago, it was a, probably a fair statement of what people knew and saw then. Do you think it's accurate now? I don't think it's the end-all, be-all. I think it depends on the expert you speak to. What about heart disease? Depends on the expert you speak to. Cancer? Depends on the expert you speak to. Uh, may I remind your lordship that it may help to shorten matters that there is an admission in this case, an admission of fact to this effect by the plaintiffs. There is a considerable amount of evidence on a relationship between a diet high in saturated fat and sodium and obesity and high blood pressure and heart disease. What about cancer? No. The admission that there was a link between diet and heart disease meant, or so it seemed to the defendants, that they had achieved their first victory, and so far as this area of the alleged libel was concerned, they had only now to establish a link between diet and cancer. McDonald's called a number of experts to testify that there was no such link. One of the first was Professor Wheelock, a university professor employed by McDonald's as a consultant on food and health policy. Mr. Rampton referred him to tables which set out the dietary content of various meals. Um, I've chosen a meal which I take to be a relatively average McDonald's meal. That is a cheeseburger, regular French fries, Diet Coke and apple pie. Is that a fair choice to have made? I would think so, yes. Professor Wheelock, provided he had sensible things at other times during the day, he could repeat that meal seven times a week, 52 weeks in the year, couldn't he? There should not be any problem. <clears throat> if your meal is heavy in fat, saturated fat, and low in fibre, and high in sodium and sugar, does it make the rest of your diet harder to balance? I thought we'd already established that. 
It doesn't matter whether it's McDonald's or anything else. It's an arithmetic fact of life. It may be uh, implicit in Miss Steele's questions that in order to have a healthy diet, you have to meet the recommendations day by day. And, uh, <clears throat> rightly or wrongly, you don't adhere to that view. No, I don't accept that. I'm not aware of many nutritionists who do. That's partly because you think people don't eat at McDonald's every day. I know people don't eat at McDonald's every day. Nobody at all. Helen Steele then introduced a London Food Commission survey on eating habits called Grazing in Peckham, which analysed how often people eat fast food like McDonald's. 32% said they were using fast food outlets once a day. If that was right, would that concern you? That people were eating that kind of food with that kind of frequency? If what you are implying is that these people are eating a high proportion of foods which themselves are high in saturated fats and high in total fat, and this makes up a high proportion of their total diet, then, yes, I would be concerned. What's your conception about junk food? This label, junk food, in our society? Well, I think junk food is something the individual has to make up their own minds about. As far as I'm concerned, junk food is something I would not want to eat. Can you give us examples of junk food? <coughs> Can I suggest one? Yes. Which um, may give pleasure to a lot of children. <coughs> Candy floss at a fair. Yes. What would you think of that yourself? Well, in my perception, that would be junk food. Hmm. Because it's basically sugar, just sugar. It's partly because it's sugar. It's sticky. It's nasty. You get it all over your face. I wouldn't really want to touch it at all. Is there any other example of junk food? You wouldn't eat. Semolina. <laughs> Did you say semolina? Yes. The reason is I don't like the stuff. So if you don't like it, it's junk food? Yes. This is what I'm trying to say to you. It depends upon the individual. So the definition of junk food isn't based on its nutritional value? It might or it might not be. The overriding consideration is that it is personal. So if people said McDonald's food is junk food? It is not junk food in my book. Malak, it is entirely accepted on behalf of the plaintiffs, and I make this clear now, that whether or not McDonald's may properly be described as junk food is entirely a question of individual opinion. What is objected to in this leaflet is not the suggestion that McDonald's is junk food, but that it kills its customers. Professor Wheelock, I'd like you to have a look at this. Uh, Malad, it's the uh, leaflet complained of. Yes, 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 yes. I draw your attention to the following features. Uh, first of all, the heading, heading set against the McDonald's Golden Arches logo. The heading McCancer. Do you see that? Yes. Then, uh, do you see the word McDisease? Yes. Uh, and the word McDeadly? Yes. Well, you pass your eye down to the middle of the page to a cartoon, a drawing of a cow in a hamburger. Do you see that? Yes. And a cow is saying, if the slaughterhouse doesn't get you, and the person on the other side of the hamburger is saying, the junk food will. And I think in the middle of that pamphlet there is a column headed, what's so unhealthy about McDonald's food? Do you see that? Yes. What they don't make clear is that a diet high, and I stress the word diet, a diet high in fat, sugar, animal products and salt, and low in fibre, vitamins and minerals. Are McDonald's meals low in vitamins and minerals? No. Which describes an average McDonald's meal, is linked with cancers of the breast and bowel and heart disease. This is accepted medical fact, not a cranky theory. Every year in Britain, heart disease alone causes about 180,000 deaths. Professor Wheelock, as a piece of nutritional advice, given the headings and the cartoon to which I draw your attention, are these statements valuable pieces of nutritional advice? In my view, they are extremely distorted and misleading. Some of the later nutritional advice given by McDonald's, particularly as part of their overseas operations, emphasised surprising long-term benefits. When Peter Cox gave evidence for the defendants, he quoted a passage about Japan from a book written with the full cooperation of McDonald's called Behind the Arches. Fujita, president of McDonald's Japan, decided to sell the hamburger to the Japanese as a revolutionary product. He gave lectures on it at universities throughout Japan. The reason Japanese people are so short and have yellow skins is because they have eaten nothing but fish and rice for 2,000 years he told reporters. If we eat McDonald's hamburgers and potatoes for a thousand years, we will become taller, our skin will become white, and our hair blonde. 
When David Green, the senior vice president of marketing for McDonald's in America, gave evidence, Mr. Rampton asked him to comment on Mr. Fujita's remark. Do you know Mr. Fujita quite well? I have met with him a number of times, yes. Does he have a sense of humor? He has a very wry sense of humor, and I can see him saying this with quite a smile on his face. Whether Mr. Fujita was joking or not, Mr. Green was entirely serious when, under cross-examination, he expressed no worries at all about persuading Americans to eat McDonald's food as frequently as possible. You mentioned that you were targeting your advertisements at heavy users of McDonald's, is that right? Yes. You also have a category you call a super heavy user, don't you? Yes. Is it true McDonald's makes attempts to focus on super heavy users? Yes, it focuses on super heavy users. Or SHUs, is that correct? That stands for super heavy users, yes. The SHU is a specific category that McDonald's has defined. Yes, it is a specific category, yes. Tell me, uh, do you see any inconsistency between a McDonald's publication that stresses uh, balance, moderation and variety on the one hand and the... Uh, the marketing angle that we must get heavy users and super heavy users coming to us more often if we can. No. There are 21 meals a week or whatever. And I think it's very consistent that you can balance your meal occasions at McDonald's with other meal occasions. In August 1994, when the hearing had already exceeded the four to six weeks originally estimated by Mr. Rampton, McDonald's executives flew over from America and made their first approach to settle the case out of court. They failed and flew back again. And even had they wanted it, the option wasn't open to McDonald's simply to pull out of the case on their own, because while McDonald's was suing Helen Steele and Dave Morris over this leaflet, Steele and Morris had now started a counterclaim libel action over this leaflet, which had been distributed in McDonald's stores and which described the London Greenpeace group as people telling lies. The battle had now become two trials in one, with both sides suing each other for libel. When we return, do Big Macs seriously damage your health? <laughs> In the autumn of 1994, the McLeibel hearing continued with the evidence of McDonald's main expert witness on diet and disease. And nothing but the truth. Now, your full name, Sidney Arnott. Sidney John Arnott. Dr. I Arnott been, said he'd been a specialist in the treatment of cancer for 20 years and that for the last 10 years he'd been a consultant at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Mr. Rampton asked him to comment on a number of scientific studies into the association between diet and cancer. These studies were summarized in an article published by the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in 1987. Then there's a section about bowel cancer. Despite the plausible theoretical mechanisms, the positive geographical correlations and the results of animal experiments, the human evidence for fat as a cause of large bowel cancer remains weak. Do you agree with that or not? I agree with that, yes. The statements which the government puts or forces tobacco manufacturers to put on cigarette packets to the effect that cigarette smoking can kill you are, in your view, both correct and desirable, yes? Indeed, yes. Do you think it would be a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing if food manufacturers put on their, let us say, pork pies, this product may give you cancer? What's your reaction to that? I think that is ludicrous because there's no evidence, no scientific evidence that that is the case. Dr. Rana, isn't it a fact that many responsible international governmental and academic organisations have said there is a link between diet and cancer, although the factors aren't known exactly. I think what is true to say is that people have suggested there may well be a link between diet and various forms of cancer, although one has not been able to show that in scientifically conducted trials. If we go to nutrition file pink six, uh, before I point you to that document, if I read this out, there is a considerable amount of evidence to suggest that many of the diseases which are more common in the Western affluent world, diseases such as obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, some forms of cancer are related to diet. Would you agree with that considerable amount of evidence? Yes. 
Do you think it would be a reasonable position in 1985 and still a reasonable position? If that is advice being given to the general public, I think it a very sensible advice to give. Because, as I have already indicated, studies have been carried out that suggest there might be a relationship between fat intake and cancer. That document is just a bit... it's actually in a file. It's a document produced by McDonald's. What's it called? It's part of... Malad. It's called Good Food, Nutrition and McDonald's. It's a United Kingdom document published in 1985. Yes, thank you. Do you want the witness to look at this? No, that's OK, that's finished with. I want to ask you about another document about advice to the public. A diet high in fat, sugar, animal products and salt and low in fibre, vitamins and minerals is linked with the cancer of the breast, bowel and heart disease. Is that a reasonable statement? It has been linked, yes. So it would be a reasonable statement? It depends to whom it is being directed. The public. If it is being directed to the public, then it is a reasonable thing to say. But if it is being directed to the scientific community, one will be more careful in the language one is using. This is a quote from the London Greenpeace fact sheet, which is the subject of the libel action. The defendants believed they had now won on the issue of establishing a link between diet and cancer as well as between diet and heart disease. But the battle wasn't quite over. After Dr Arnott left the witness box three months into the hearing, McDonald's applied to change their original libel claim. If successful, the defendants would have to prove not just that the contents of an average McDonald's meal are linked with cancers of the breast and bowel and heart disease, but a much higher meaning, that McDonald's sell meals which cause cancer of the bowel and heart disease in their customers. Mr Justice Bell was still considering this application when the defendant's first expert witness on diet and disease started to give evidence. He was Professor Crawford, the World Health Organization expert consultant on the role of dietary fats in human nutrition. Helen Steele began by taking Professor Crawford through his witness statement. Right, just going to page four, this is really dealing with some of the evidence given by other witnesses, where those witnesses have claimed that there is no proof that diet is linked to cancer. No, my love, they have not said that. The witnesses have not said there is no proof that diet is linked with cancer. The word linked should be abandoned, perhaps, for the purpose of these proceedings. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, use the word cause. Uh, I, I, know, I know the word links uh, in the text, or medical facts in the text. It may be that Mr. Rampton will argue that if you use the phrase medical fact, that, that, that it hardens up link in some way. We, we have on the leaflet one of the arches with McCancer in it, so he's going to argue it wouldn't surprise me that McCancer itself means that McDonald's food causes cancer. Obviously we're going to argue that the leaflet nowhere states that if you eat McDonald's food you'll get cancer. Yes, I, I know you are, I know you are, but the case you have to meet is that it's alleged against you that it does mean cause. I just want to say, I think the plaintiffs are shifting their ground considerably. No, don't, don't bother about that. What I said to you about possible interpretation was that you didn't think it was automatic victory for you and defeat for McDonald's in this, this discreet area of the case if you, if you establish link, um, whatever that means, rather than cause. That's all. Professor Crawford was in the witness box only for one day and didn't complete his evidence and the judge still hadn't decided whether the defendants had to prove a link or a cause when they called their next expert witness on diet and disease. He was Dr. Neil Barnard, president of the American Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. What are the problems with the kind of products yes, can I ask you to pause there? One of the questions in this case uh, may be what's meant when you say something's linked with something else. That phrase, linked with, what's it mean to you? It primarily means associated, that the two things go together, with an implication that there may be a role of cause, although it may not necessarily be a direct cause and effect relationship. Dr. Barnard, can I read you a passage from a McDonald's document distributed or available to the public in 1985? Um, there's a considerable amount of evidence to suggest that many of the diseases which are more common in the Western affluent world, diseases such as obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke and some forms of cancer, are related to diet. Now, can I give you 
this thing. This is the outer sleeve of a packet of French cigarettes called Gitane. Can I hand it to you? But I, I see it's empty. So this is not an autobiographical glimpse, Mr. Ramp. Absolutely not. Nor should it be taken as such. On the front, you find the name of the brand. And then, uh, can you read out what it says in capital letters below the name, Jutan? Tobacco can seriously damage your health. Yes. Now, will you please turn the sleeve over onto the other side and read out what it says? Smoking causes cancer. So it does. Now, what I want to know is whether you see a distinction between that statement about smoking and the statement about diet, which is in the McDonald's document of 1985. Do you see a distinction, Dr. Barnard, between suspicion and guilt? The sentence in the McDonald's booklet seems to convey, at least to my reading, more than a suspicion, but less than conclusive evidence. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind if I may add an autobiographical note, I wouldn't mind that sleeve back, otherwise the content will collapse in my pocket later on. Thank you very much. Is that, strictly speaking, a medical fact? Smoking causes cancer? It might be more accurate to say smoking can cause cancer, in that in many individuals it does, but in others it does not. But for some individuals it does cause cancer. The defendants complained again that it was only because McDonald's had been forced to admit there was a link between diet and both heart disease and cancer that they were now trying to shift the goalposts. The judge disagreed, but later in the trial, one year later in fact and after much deliberation, he ruled that the defendants had to prove that eating McDonald's food bears the very real risk that you will suffer cancer or heart disease as a result. It wasn't until two years later that new evidence was heard on this subject, and by then, attitudes had hardened even further. Here is McDonald's expert, Dr. Sidney Arnott, two years later, at the start of his cross-examination by Helen Steele. Do you have your statement in front of you? Yes, I do, thank you. The first paragraph reads, Since my last report, the strength of belief of the direct relationship between diet and the development of certain forms of cancer has become less strong. And here, the defendant's expert, Professor Michael Crawford, also questioned two years later by Ms. Steele. Have you a copy of your statement in front of you? Yes, I have. Since submitting my first contribution, it is my view that the evidence relating diet to cancer and heart disease has hardened. Mr. Justice Bell had decided that the scientific evidence was too complicated for a jury to consider, so it would now be for him alone to decide which of these two conflicting expert views was correct. When we return, are McDonald's responsible for the torture and murder of animals? Uh, then we go down to, in what way are McDonald's responsible for torture and murder? Uh, this appears, as you shortly see, to be a reference to the slaughter of animals. Um, in the slaughterhouse, animals often struggle to escape. Do you know of any evidence on that score? No. Mr. Preston, if you had evidence that animals struggled to escape, that they became frantic, that their conditions of keeping and rearing were inhumane and cruel, what would you do about it? If I found out that to be going on, I'd counsel the supplier. If I found out it to go on having been counsel, I'd terminate the supplier. He'd never sell to me again. When the animals go up the runway, you can see the terror in their eyes when they approach the kill floor. This is Howard Lyman, giving evidence for the defense about the slaughter of cattle in America. Formerly a ranch owner, he's now a convinced vegetarian. The animals are stunned by what they call a, a captive bolt pistol. They stun the animal, drop him to the floor, hang it up by its hind legs, and then cut its throat, which is what causes death. Now, occasionally, an animal's not fully stunned. And when they drop it to the floor, the animal gets up. This usually happens several times a week. That animal is absolutely terrified, running around the floor. There is no doubt. Those animals go into the kill floor, know they are going to die, and they are not pleased. Right, this general scene does that apply to all or most of the slaughterhouses that you visited, both when you were a farmer and when you were making all these visits? What I'm talking about is the absolute standard of the industry. 
Get them in as quickly as possible. Kill them as quickly as possible. The idea of a humane slaughter absolutely does not exist. Do you know what is the method by which cattle are stunned in this country before slaughter, before they are bled? Yes. What is it called? They use a gun. It shoots them in the head. It stuns them completely. Uh, there's a technical term for it, but uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Perhaps I can help. It's the uh, captive boat system. That's it. Captive boat. The idea, as you said, is to stun them first before, before they are bled out and turned into meat. Now, is that a method which has been, as it were, I do not say approved, but that method is the one which is used, therefore, does it follow, for the bulk of the cattle which are used for McDonald's meat in this part of the world? Yes, it is used here in this part of the world. So far as you are aware, is that a matter which should be regarded as humane or inhumane? It's the most humane method that exists. Mr. Rampton asked Mr. Preston about an article in the Bournemouth Advertiser dated 12th of October 1989 in which a consultant pathologist was quoted as criticising the captive bolt method. He says, that is the pathologist, it is a horrifying fact that approximately one third of the cattle shot in this way are not stunned but stand grievously wounded and fully conscious while the pistol is reloaded. Mr. Preston, do you have any information to suggest that might be so? The statement is totally false. The captive bolt system is darn near perfect, nearly 100% accurate. If it were the case that you discovered that the people who slaughtered cattle for McDonald's were using a method as horrendously inefficient as that, what would you do about it? It would not work for me. Does your company object to the attribution to it of approval of methods as barbaric as that? Barbaric methods have no place involved with McDonald's. Under cross-examination, Dave Morris reminded Mr. Preston that McDonald's had threatened legal action against the Bournemouth Advertiser. The defendants believed this to be yet another example of how McDonald's try to silence their critics, no matter how big or small. The paper printed an apology approved by McDonald's, which read, McDonald's Restaurants Limited have asked us to point out that they do not approve of the captive bolt method and are highly concerned with ethical issues. But you do use the captive bolt method for supplies of your beef. Is that correct in this country? I cannot speak for all of them. I assume that some must. The purchasing folks are the best to ask about that one, I'm afraid. Those details are not for me. Dr. Gregory, you visited for the purposes of this case, I think, uh, four establishments, did you not? This is Dr. Neville Gregory, Senior Research Fellow of Food Animal Science at Bristol University, the main expert called by McDonald's to give evidence about animal breeding and slaughter in Britain. Mr. Rampton asked him about statements made in the London Greenpeace pamphlet. Uh, murdering Big Mac. In the slaughterhouse, animals often struggle to escape. In the slaughterhouse at Bowes, in the slaughterhouse at Midland Meat Packers and at the other plant, did you ever see animals struggling to escape pigs or cows? Not that I could identify, no. A recent British government report criticised inefficient stunning methods which frequently resulted in animals having their throats cut while still fully conscious. McDonald's are responsible for the deaths of countless animals by this supposedly humane method. Dr Gregory, in your observation of the suppliers of McDonald's with meat from chicken, pigs and cows, did you find any evidence to support the statement that animals were frequently conscious while they had their throats cut? In the case of cattle or pigs, it was never. In the case of frequently with chickens, I think the answer is also no. Dr. Gregory had visited Sun Valley, a firm supplying McDonald's with poultry for processing into chicken McNuggets. And under cross-examination, Dr. Gregory agreed that chickens at Sun Valley were not provided with all of the basic needs set out in the official code of practice for the welfare of domestic fowls. The chickens at Sun Valley, for example, don't have access to sunlight, do they? That is correct. They don't have much room to move around in either, do they? Well, that's a bit of a general statement, isn't it? 18 birds per square metre. I measured this this morning. What we're saying is that each bird has less space than the size of an A4 sheet of paper. OK, I haven't done the sums myself. No, but um, just look at that. Doesn't this still surprise you? 
That seems realistic. When you walk through the birds towards the end of the crop, you have to be very careful where you're treading. In terms of comparing between what a chicken's normal behaviour would be and what it is in a broiler shed, their movements are quite restricted. Its movement is undoubtedly less in a broiler shed. Severely restricted? Not severely, it is just less. And what about flying? <laughs> well, the Gallus domesticus is not an adept bird at flying. In the adult lightweight laying hen, they are certainly more so, but broilers are not adept at flying. It's one of the reasons why broiler hens might not want to fly, because they've been bred to be very heavy. Well, it may be that their wings are not powerful enough to sustain the weight of their body in flight. That is a possibility. Is there any other natural behaviour they can't exhibit in the broiler unit? I think if you had laying hens outdoors, they would spend a bit of time sunbathing. They do have a predilection, so it seems, to sunbathe. As another example, chickens normally, do they have a family structure? Oh, that's a good point. In a family situation, there would be some parental care, and this would not occur in a commercial situation. Helen Steele questioned Dr. Gregory about the slaughter of chickens and about a design fault in the electrical stunning process whereby over 13% of the chickens before they were stunned were exposed to an earlier pre-stun shock. Under the slaughter of poultry humane conditions regulations, you see it is an offence to subject the bird to unnecessary pain or unnecessary distress from the time of arrival at the slaughterhouse to the time of death. Yes. How many days a week to Sun Valley slaughter poultry, do you know? To the best of my knowledge, it's um, five days a week with two shifts. So if we're talking about 13.5% of birds getting pre stun shocks, that's going to be quite a considerable number. Yes. It's going to be several thousand a day. Yes. Mm. pre stun shock may be negligible or it may be painful. Yes, the um, question of whether it is painful, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you get a physical recoil from the shock itself and um, well, well this is rather a loose term the word pain um, some people do describe it as painful do you consider it painful yes it's something that will cause distress oh yes it is alarming very alarming I think just to put a figure on it I think it actually works out at 17.5 thousand a day that will be receiving pre-stun shocks? I don't know. That's based on the total slaughtered at Sun Valley being 35 million chickens a year. Alan Steele then asked about the stunning process itself, where the line of chickens shackled upside down by their legs have their heads dipped into a bath of water with electric current running through it. This process was intended to stun all of the birds, but Dr Gregory found that some of them showed signs that they were still conscious when the line moved forward for their necks to be cut. Going back to your statement, you said 0.7% of birds showed a reflex response. It's a matter of concern. It is a matter of concern. Right, because 0.7% of birds would represent 942 birds a day. Okay. Based on 35 million being killed a year. Helen Steele then asked Dr. Gregory about the method of slaughter recommended by the RSPCA and favoured by Dr. Gregory himself, which ensured that the shock administered did not simply stun, but was strong enough to cause cardiac arrest and kill the bird as quickly as possible. So you and the RSPCA agree that the best method would be to use the stun kill method? I do. Do you know why Sun Valley poultry aren't using this method? I do. Why do they say they're not using it? Because of trials they have done in their establishment at Hereford, which have shown that if they use high currents, which are inevitable to produce a cardiac arrest, it is associated with a higher prevalence of quality problems in the carcass. So they're doing it for economic reasons? Yes. After slaughter, the line of chickens moves into a scalding bath for the feathers to be removed. But Dr. Gregory found that some of the chickens were still not quite dead. Uh, at Sun Valley Poultry, you concluded that 1% of birds have residual brainstem activity at scalding. Yes. So, obviously, they are therefore alive. Yes. And the 1% of birds that weren't dead at scalding, that's around 1,350 each day. That's quite a significant number. I understand. So it's possible they could come round? I have known of situations where birds have come around. They've been taken off the line at that point unconscious and then have come around subsequently. I have known this, but um, it is unusual.
but it is possible. Yes, fair comment. Over the following months, the court heard evidence about animal welfare and slaughter, both from McDonald's suppliers and from some of the top people at McDonald's. This is Edward Oakley, a senior vice president of McDonald's UK. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Do you know what the codes of practice are in this country about stocking densities in broiler units? Not specifically. I leave that to the experts at Sun Valley. Are you aware that Sun Valley stock over the recommended stocking density? We don't actually make the checks. The checks are made by the government health inspectors and the veterinary officers. Um, if there was a problem, I'm sure they would have told us, and we would certainly deal with it if that were the case. That's why I'm very surprised that... I don't know where you got your information from, but I'm very surprised at that. From Mr. Gregory. From the evidence of Mr. Gregory, who is McDonald's expert witness. Well, I haven't seen that, that particular evidence. Mr. Gregory has certainly never made us aware of the problem. So as far as McDonald's are concerned, you just bury your heads in the sand and assume nothing's happened? No, of course not. We would know if there was anything wrong. How would you know if you don't make the checks? We've, we've been through this now. You've made your point to the point. Dr. Gregory said that of the birds he studied, 44% had leg abnormalities, yes? I put it to you, Mr. Oakley, that if chickens are forced to live within an A4 size of paper and that during transportation many receive bruises and broken legs, some dying as a result, up to 14% of chickens receive pre-stun shocks, if that is the evidence of your expert witness, you don't care about animal welfare at all, do you? You haven't got the slightest bit of interest in the welfare of animals. Your only interest is making money out of those animals. That was a question. Oh, was it? I'm putting to you that you have no animal welfare. The answer to your question is the same as it was earlier, and that is that it's our job to conform to the industry codes of practice. I'm not sure if the horror story that Mr. Morris referred to right there would be any different if the chickens came from a farmyard. Maybe even worse. The next witness was McDonald's main expert from America on animal welfare. Dr. Fernando Gomez Gonzalez was born in Mexico, took three top degrees at the University of Texas, and is now manager of meat products in McDonald's International Quality Assurance and Purchasing Department. He explained McDonald's worldwide concern about animal welfare during breeding and slaughter, and was then asked about egg-laying chickens kept in battery cages. Have you thought about the animal welfare implications of keeping four birds in a cage for, I suppose, the duration of their useful lives? Absolutely. In a house, there is no access to fresh air or sunshine. Yes, I have thought about it, yes. They don't have the sun warming their backs in spring or early summer while they sit in a dust bath, do they? Not the sun. That is correct. You're waxing quite lyrical, Mr. Rand. My question was, and it was a serious question, was whether you had studied the animal welfare implications of a bird inside a house inside a cave. Yes, I have. As opposed to a bird free to fly about, sit in the dust, sit in the sunshine, so on and so forth and able to lay its eggs wherever it pleases within a given area, which I think is how we might describe a free-range chicken in this country. Okay. I'm going to start by saying it is very difficult to get information from the animal. That you will understand. I cannot ask it. So, one way we can get very good information is by looking at the health of the animal. You can look at how the animal looks, how the animal stands. Look at the feathers, do they shine? You can look at the eyes. But there is one very good indication which will tell you everything, and that is the weight. Weight? The weight of the bird, whether it is a broiler or an egg-laying hen. Any stressed animal will suffer, and it will show in its appearance, and it will show in its weight. A happy hen, a hen that is not under stress, will look better and will have a better weight. If an animal grows in a cage from day one, they think that is their natural environment. Those birds that have grown in such an environment will not be significantly under stress. On the other hand, 
a free-range chicken, when it is out, is subject to the environment, is subject to distress, because it could go hungry, it could not find its friends or relatives. It is subject to predators. They are more susceptible to diseases. So, when they are out in the open under uncontrolled conditions, they will suffer physiologically and they will be more susceptible to diseases. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Gomez Gonzalez. Uh, to what extent in your experience does additional weight give rise to problems like leg disabilities and things like that? They do not have the same problems that a regular bird will have. They have been selected keeping in mind the health of the animal. It is not economically feasible to raise animals that are physically deficient. The profits will not allow it. The business would not survive. You're associating gaining weight with being healthier. There's no reason why those two things should be automatically linked, is there? There is a high correlation with that. What else is there for them to do in their cage apart from sit there and put on weight? Eat and put on weight? That is their environment. If I may clarify one thing that hopefully will explain my point. There is a distinct difference between humans and animals. If you look, and it has been fairly well documented in psychology books and research, a major difference between humans and animals is that we are aware. It is what is called an awareness factor. We know our position on this earth. I could see myself, I can envision myself out of this planet and look down from the moon and see the earth and see the continents and see the islands and know where I am. I know I am in court right now. I know I have the choice to go somewhere else. I know that something else is out there. Animals do not have that ability. That is the big Difference. How do you know they don't have that ability? If you will let me finish. An animal who is born and raised in a cage does not know, it is not aware that there is an outdoors. It is not aware that he has a choice. An animal assumes that that is their environment and it will be comfortable in that environment. That is a fact. Court rise. By the spring of 1995, the hearing had lasted almost eight months. The defendants had been complaining that they were feeling under constant pressure. And on March the 6th, Helen Steele sent a letter to the judge explaining why her doctor thought she needed a rest and a break from the trial. Mr Rampton, I've, <coughs> I've received a letter from Miss Steele this morning. Attached to it is a letter from her doctor. I'll read out parts if that's what you want me to do. Yes, all right. Mm. Um, I've been suffering from stress as a result of the court case and over the past month this has been increasing to a point where it's affecting my ability to present our case. <laughs> Whilst we appreciate the provision of breaks for preparation time, I would also request breaks for a rest for the sake of my health. The attached letters from my doctor to confirm this. I don't know whether you want me to read part of the doctor's letter or not. Uh, well, I think it's essential that those representing McDonald's should uh, know as much as possible. Uh, there's a reference to one particular condition which, which you've not referred to, and uh, <coughs> I, I, I do understand that. Um, why don't you read out the whole of that doctor's letter, except, I'm looking at line five, the second, third and fourth words. Dear sir, I'm writing in support of Miss Steele's request for more frequent breaks in her current court case on medical grounds. Miss Steele has been to see me... After Helen Steele finished reading the letter from her doctor, the possibility of a break later in the month was discussed. But this was not to be the last time that the effect of stress on Helen Steele's health would become an issue during the course of this marathon hearing. So the trial continued. The final evidence for the defendants on animal welfare came from a man who, unlike earlier management and expert witnesses, had daily practical experience of working with animals bred for slaughter. John Bruton, who has difficulty reading and writing, was a poultry catcher at Sun Valley from 1987 to 1993. He was a member of a team of five whose job it was to catch and pack chickens into crates of drawers which were then loaded onto a lorry. 
He said that the team was always under pressure to work as fast as possible. Can you describe the catching procedure? Catching procedure? How were the birds picked up to be put into the drawers? By the legs. One leg. One leg. Um, and how many birds would you carry in each hand? Um, six. Some would catch more. Some people have smaller hands and they catch less. Some people have bigger hands and they catch more. Uh, once they was caught, they was thrown into a drawer. What would happen to any sick or injured birds that are at the farms? Well, if they was flapping about or running around or whatever, then they'd go into a crate and go to the factory. On a number of occasions, you'd see birds with broken wings and scabs on them. The farmer said, this is all part of our crop, it all goes to the factory. So they were just loaded up like the others? Yes, well, the only things that didn't get loaded into the crates is sort of what you call dead birds, or birds that had been dead and left in the shed for days. How many dead birds were there usually in a shed? 150, 200 on average. Birds would be left in a shed with their uh, brothers and sisters eating dead birds. Could you tell how long they appeared to have been left there? It's hard to say. Could have been hours. And if the air was really bad with the smell of gone-off birds, you could say they'd been there for a day plus, because they'd be rife and all swollen up. Sorry, uh, just going to the loading, did it ever happen that birds' heads got trapped in the drawers? Yes, on uh, more than one occasion, you'd be loading and rushing. And perhaps you might put your first two handfuls in the drawer, and the last one would just throw his in, and the chicken might be just having a look about. Well, I'm just using this as an instance. Sticks his head through the drawer, and the person shutting it never recognises it because of the time given. He just wants to shut the drawer and carry on with his work. When you entered the sheds, before you started the catching, what was the reaction of the birds? Once the doors is open, the birds is spooked. All rush down the other end of the shed, climbing down the sides of the walls, climbing on top of one another, causing smothering. Not so many dead, but where you was trying to dig them out, you'd find broken wings and broken legs. When you started at Sun Valley, were you given any kind of training in how to catch or handle the birds? <laughs> None whatsoever. You went for your interview, and if you was lucky, you got a job, and you were told the time to start. Mr Broughton, did you ever kick birds and get them out of the way to make room for the crates or whatever they are? Yes, I did. Did you ever pick them up by the wings or the neck? Yes, I did. You know that kind of behaviour is directly contrary to the company's instructions, don't you? Not really, sir, no. You don't. I apologise for this question, but it is something the defendant told us earlier. Can you read? Not very well. Not very well. When you took your job at Sun Valley, was it explained to you that you must not pick up the birds by their wings, tail or neck? No. I put it to you, Mr Bruton, that what you have told is a mixture of lies and exaggeration. Why do you say I'm exaggerating? Because you were sacked by Sun Valley for dishonesty, for not wearing a hat, for obtaining company property by deception. Where's the evidence that I have company property by deception? Did the police visit your house on Saturday the 22nd of May 1993? Yes. Did they find in your house, in an upstairs room, neatly stored in a cardboard box, 49 new, unused pairs of yellow ribbed gloves that didn't belong to you? That's not correct. It's not correct. So they did find the gloves, but they were your property, were they? Some of them was my property, yes. The majority belonged to Sun Valley, didn't they? That's not correct. Did they find nine pairs of overalls, six of which were brand new? That's not correct. What is not correct? The amount of overalls that was new. How many were new? One. Did they find 17 pairs of brand new white seafarer boot socks? That's not correct. It is not correct? That's not correct. The number might be correct, but the make isn't right. The make isn't right? That's right. Tell me about the make, then. There was two different types of socks. One make was Seafarer, wasn't it? Yeah, but not 17 pair of. That's the kind issued by Sun Valley for use by their catching teams, isn't it? That's right. You were dismissed on the 26th of May, 1993, weren't you? Yes. They got rid of us. Because they was looking to put contract teams in, and they was looking for excuses. 
It was not the case that this kit belonged to Sun Valley. It was an opening to say, this man looking for excuses, let's get rid of him. You were angry, weren't you, that you were sacked that way? Oh, I wasn't annoyed at having the sack. I was annoyed at the way it was done. And that's why you're here to tell us this fanciful story about the way the birds were treated. I don't think it's a fancy story. It's true to life. You ask me again in 20 years' time, I'll tell you the same. Because I've seen it with my own two eyes. So I hear you say, I'm grateful. Um, can, can I say one thing? Yeah. Um, I'm stood here today, <clears throat> accused of being, accused of stealing. Now, could the people who have made those allegations to your worship there, make those allegations to myself? And I'll see if I can get it sorted. Thank you, Mr. Bruton. Cheers. But perhaps the last word on this issue should be left to David Walker, from whom we'll be hearing a good deal more later in the trial. Mr. Walker is chairman of one of McDonald's main meat suppliers and president of the British Meat Manufacturers Association. As a result of the meat industry, the suffering of animals is inevitable. The answer to that must be yes. So both sides were agreed. Animals bred for slaughter must experience suffering. But McDonald's case was that whatever the suffering caused to animals reared for their products, this could never justify the claims made in the leaflet that McDonald's were guilty of deliberate cruelty and torture. When we return, what's your poison? E. coli? <laughs> Can we pass on in the leaflet down the second column and get to the box, what's your poison? Have you got that one? What's your poison? I have it. Among the claims made in the London Greenpeace leaflet was that meat was responsible for 70% of all food poisoning and that when animals were slaughtered, bacteria from faeces and urine could contaminate the meat. This, as we all now know, brings with it the risk of E. coli. Leaving aside the one incident in Preston in Lancashire in January 1991, do you know of any other case in which anybody has suffered food poisoning in this country as a result of eating your food? No. The outbreak in Preston, it was quite a serious matter, wasn't it? It was very serious. In the 1991 outbreak, a number of people needed hospital treatment for severe medical problems after eating burgers from McDonald's store in Friargate, Preston. The main witness to give evidence for McDonald's about hygiene in the manufacture of hamburgers was Mr. David Walker, president of the British Meat Manufacturers Association and chairman of McKee Food Services. Mr. Rampton asked him what happened after animals had been slaughtered and were being de-gutted. It's important that the intestines, or the uh, guts, or whatever you like to call them, are not split or damaged during the course of this operation. Very important. That's where the E. coli infection might come from. You recognise you have a responsibility for your customers' well-being. Absolutely. Or well, the ultimate customers, anyway. It doesn't do your business any good if you're killing people on a regular basis, does it? <laughs> no. <laughs> that was not meant humorously. McDonald's insists that their meat is E. coli free, in effect, is that right? Yes. Did you introduce, apart from testing for E. coli specifically, which in fact you started before the Preston incident, any precautionary measures as a result of the Preston outbreak? Well, we changed our slaughtering technique by amending our hide specification in that the esophagus and the bung had to be tied off before the animal was eviscerated. My, uh, <coughs> my steer anatomy is not that reliable. Uh, Mr. Rampton, I understand tying off the esophagus. Did you say the bung? The bung. B-U-N-G, sir. That's the other end. That is the other end. Other end. The defendants asked for discovery of the records of McKee's daily contamination tests. But later in the trial, Mr. Rampton told the judge that unfortunately those records had been accidentally destroyed by Group 4 security. Over 30 days, witnesses from both sides gave detailed evidence about hygiene at McDonald's suppliers. The main witness for the defendants was Dr. Richard North, who had worked as an environmental health officer for 15 years before taking a postgraduate degree at Leeds Metropolitan University. What are your concerns 
about specifically chicken and minced meat as used in burgers and food poisoning. The general concern is the very high level of pathogenic microorganisms found in these meats. Once you start mincing, you distribute the contamination and bury it within the texture of the product and therefore make it more difficult to kill when you apply surface heating. Dr North had visited McKees and said that although the plant there was visually impressive, he was concerned about the method of transport of the meat from the abattoirs to the processing plant. It comes in what I've learned to call combo bins. What I understand by some of the stuff are called compost bins. Because what they have are these very square bins in which meat is squashed together and you have the meat of many, many animals confined together in one pack. They're actually the, the same shape as some makes of garden compost you can get at your local garden centre, so it mightn't have been anything to do with the food, might it? Both in terms of visible description and function, because if you wanted to compost the stuff, that is certainly how you do it. It is not, in my view, the ideal way to transport meat. It does mean, inevitably, you are increasing opportunities for cross-contamination. Dr North then condemned the sampling techniques used at McKees as empty rituals without scientific validity. McKees took five samples from each combo bin for laboratory analysis, but Dr North said that statistically five samples were nowhere near enough to be sure of locating a pathogen like E. coli. So if Mr Walker said in his evidence that the meat was free from E. coli 0157, what is your conclusion on that? All one can say of that is McKees have no way of knowing whether or not it is free from 0157 and are not carrying out any scientifically based programme which would enable them to give any such assurance. But other witnesses, including Professor Michael Jackson, head of environmental health at Strathclyde University, who had visited McKees on two occasions, gave evidence that the level of food safety control was highly satisfactory at all of McDonald's suppliers. When Helen Steele cross-examined Mr Walker, yes, she returned to the outbreak of food poisoning in Preston. There was an outbreak of food poisoning in Preston in January 1991, wasn't there? Centred on McDonald's store in Friargate. That's been admitted by the plaintiffs. There was an outbreak of E. coli infection in 1991, yes. The admission says that in January 1991, a number of people suffered food poisoning after eating burgers from McDonald's in Friargate, Preston. McDonald's refused to admit responsibility despite a public health laboratory official report into the incident, identifying the company which concluded that the problem may not have been completely restricted to a single branch or to a single hamburger chain. Survivors of the outbreak only received some compensation without admission of liability, that is by McDonald's, after strenuous and lengthy efforts. They've now admitted that. They have not admitted it was in the meat. If you could turn to the defendant's document, I think it's supplementary list number 22. Well, I suspect this is going to be an inadmissible document, but I, I don't... Helen Steele wanted to refer to a report published by the Public Health Laboratory Service following the Preston incident, but Mr Rampton argued against this. But I'm antipathetic to this way of proceeding, particularly when, by coincidence, no doubt, there is a member of the press in court this morning. The defendant's... Oh, <laughs> my lord, I am concerned about it. Uh... One reason why it's obvious the Preston incident was admitted was to prevent the defendants milking it for adverse publicity to McDonald's. Yes, well, that, 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 that may be, that may be, but I've, I've never been a conspiracy theorist, and I, I see no reason to believe that things are just raised because there's a member of press in the court. No, but my well, let's, let's leave that to one side. The way around such problem as there may be is simply to put a suggestion to the witness based on the document we have. I just want to say I'm concerned about what Mr Ranton said, about the fact that they've made an admission precisely to avoid publicity. Personally, I find that's an abuse of the court procedure, really. If they've made an admission, I don't know why there's any resistance to having the issue looked into. That's, that's not right. Let's just follow the procedure. I've said. Lord, Mr Morris may not yet have grasped the effect of your ruling. What is admitted is that there was such a report and what its conclusion was and that at the time McDonald's did not admit liability despite the findings of the report. The admission was made for the purpose of these proceedings and these proceedings only. I want to ask something in relation to Mr Ranton's last comment, which is he seems to be kind of retracting the admission, as it were. No! I don't, I don't, I don't take it to be that. It's, it's, a, it's a form of words which arises quite often in litigation, because 
And I'm not talking about this case. Someone might say, well, actually, I don't think I was liable, but this is only a £750 claim. I don't mind admitting I was liable because I don't want to spend £500,000 saving £750. But I'm not making an admission at large in the world because the next claim may be for what, £4 million. And I, may, I may think it is worth spending £500,000 fighting the issue. But as far as this case is concerned, because the admission is made, Age, you're entitled to treat what's admitted as fact. For this case? Yes. I don't know. I'm surprised. I would have thought you'd made an admission because it's the truth. No. I'm sorry. Life's not quite as simple as that. But even if McDonald's were responsible for an outbreak like that at Preston, this might either have been caused by food contamination during processing or by inefficient cooking at the restaurant. John Atherton joined McDonald's in 1982 and is now head of training with overall responsibility for four departments at McDonald's. One of them, the health and safety department, is concerned with the health and safety of both customers and staff. Food safety. Can I ask you as head of training how you see your role in the McDonald's company? I think the daily product check safety checklist would be a good example. It's to be found in each store? That is to be found in each store. One notices that at each stage in the day, that is to say, breakfast, main menu, mid-shift and evening shift changeover, one of the items which is required is an internal temperature check. That's correct. Is that for all products? It's for the beef and the chicken, the eggs on breakfast, also the sausages. What is the reason for that? To ensure that the product is fully cooked. When was it introduced, do you know? Not the exact date, but uh, early 1992. Early 1992. What instrument is used to ascertain the internal temperature of a product? It's called a pyrometer within McDonald's. Can we call it a thermometer? Yes, a digital thermometer would be a good description. The reason for making the check at the internal temperature is to ensure that it's at a temperature at which pathogens would have been killed. Is that right? That's correct. Not only is the temperature checked, but the product is destroyed. Destructive testing, it's called. We rip it to pieces to ensure that every element of it is cooked properly. Mr. North, the test that you saw conducted at the store for the efficient cooking of the products, how reassuring were the tests that you saw? Essentially not terribly reassuring. It takes a great deal of experience to get an accurate reading from an internal thermometer. You start off with a very high temperature outside on the surface of the burger, and the temperature reduces towards the center. It's quite a considerable difference. Bearing in mind the probes are manually inserted, slight variations in the depth to which the probe is inserted can have a considerable effect on the temperature actually measured. The temperature away from the centre, is it likely to be higher or lower than the minimum temperature they're seeking when they do the internal tests? More often, in the nature of things, the error is likely to go on the high side. So, a temperature of 75 or 80 degrees? It may be that there are areas lower than that. Indeed so. Does this relate to your view of visual hygiene versus inherent hygiene? That is very much the point. It is very often the case that premises may be brilliantly equipped, very clean, brightly lit, with staff extremely well dressed, very smart, purposefully managed. Yet, by the very fact of it producing a food poisoning case or cases, means by definition it is not hygienic. Dave Morris asked Mr. Atherton about an outbreak of food poisoning in Oregon in America in 1982 when 47 people, all of whom had eaten at McDonald's, were found to be suffering from poisoning caused by E. coli O157. Morris wanted to know why the witness, whose job carried the responsibility for food safety in England, knew nothing of an outbreak in America which had predated the Preston incident by 10 years. The judge took this up with Mr Atherton. If it turns out to be the, uh, a fact that the uh, authorities who investigated the Preston outbreak and uh, an outbreak in Oregon in 1982 came to the view that undercooking and or cross-contamination played a part in the responsibility for outbreaks of E. coli poisoning, you weren't made aware of that. That's right. I wasn't made aware of that. The question I want to put to you is, presumably, you get to hear things about the company history relevant to your job. Indeed. People will say, oh, you're in that department. Did you hear about such and such that happened? Yes. So why the... Well, don't you know about these important... No, 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 Mr Morris, Mr Morris, just put it as a sensible question. 
Why don't you know? I'm sorry. I'm just getting a bit carried calm away. Down. Calm down. You managed to get through 98% of this trial so far in a perfectly civilised way. I know. It just gets very frustrating sometimes. Does McDonald's have a blind spot about anything that is critical of the company? No. Nope. I would say that anything that is critical is very much in focus and at the forefront of everyone's mind. When Helen Steele continued the cross-examination of Mr Atherton, she wanted to know how many incidents of food poisoning at McDonald's he was aware of. I am aware that from time to time we will get a contact from a customer that suggests that they've had food poisoning at McDonald's. Right, and how often does that occur? Infrequently. Can you give any useful estimate? A useful estimate? Mm. Per store, for example. Alleged incidents of food poisoning by customers per store. It would have to be a complete shot in the dark. It may be three or four, five a year. It may be more than that. There was nobody from the press in court that morning, but there were members of a group of people calling themselves the McLibel Support Group, whose press releases had become an increasing source of irritation to McDonald's as the trial progressed. This group now made a simple calculation based on the number of McDonald's stores in the UK and released a report stating that McDonald's had admitted receiving at least 1,500 to 2,750 complaints of food poisoning each year. However, it was McDonald's case that any instances of food poisoning were negligible given that they sold over 10 billion meals throughout the world each year. Helen Steele now took up the question of customer complaints about food poisoning with McDonald's Senior Quality Assurance Supervisor, Mr Keith Kenny. Serious complaints would be investigated by your company, would they? Yes. If it was alleged that someone had died, as a result of eating a McDonald's hamburger, that would be investigated, would it? I'm sure it would, yes. You'd know about that, would you? Yes, I would expect to know about that. But you haven't heard about Wing Commander Derek Simmons in Nutsford? When was that, sorry? In 1991. I've never heard of it. If you could get pink volume 8B. Turn to tab 19, please. Can you just read that? OK. This is a letter from some solicitors in May 1993. It says the cause of death of Wing Commander Derek Simmons was acute staphylococcal endocarditis, yes? Yes. The solicitors allege that this was caused as a result of having eaten a McDonald's burger at 1pm on February the 1st, 1991 at McDonald's outlet in Water Lane, Wimslow, Cheshire. Yes. Details are given to assist with McDonald's investigating this. Yes. But you're not aware of this? No, this is the first time I've seen this. If you'd seen this letter, would you have investigated it? Well, yes. So no one's ever brought anything like it to your attention? I have never seen this letter before today. If I put it to you that you do not, in fact, investigate all incidents of food poisoning, what would you say to that? Can you just repeat that question, please? It suggested to you that you do not, in fact, investigate all alleged incidents of food poisoning. We investigate them to the extent that complaints are kept on a computer, and it would be true to say that every individual case is not investigated. But if there were more than one in the same restaurant over a similar period of time, then that would be investigated. Those are the criteria for investigation, are they? Or if somebody had been positively diagnosed as having food poisoning, there would be an investigation. Is that because it's a law that you have to investigate it? If there are stool samples, for example, or it's recorded? Yes, legally, we'd have to investigate that. McDonald's has been taken to court on a number of occasions, hasn't it? For selling undercooked burgers and other meat products. They have been in court, yes. Helen Steele then asked Mr Kenny about five other cases when McDonald's had been charged with selling undercooked burgers or chicken McNuggets. McDonald's were found guilty in every case, but on appeal the verdict was overturned in two of them on the grounds that the company had shown due diligence and was therefore not responsible for freak occurrences or lack of care shown by a member of staff. The issue of due diligence was taken further by Dave Morris when Dr North was giving evidence. Just before we go on, do you think there's any relation between what you call ritualistic testing 
and the legal defence in food safety cases of due diligence? Yes. The answer to that is clearly yes. It's become a game, a very cynical game in some industries where you saturate the environmental health authorities and the courts with massive documentation in order to claim due diligence. When Mr Rumpton cross-examined Dr North, he went through some of the witness's earlier publications, including a book called Chicken Gate, which he'd written in collaboration with Teresa Gorman, following the Edwina Curry eggs and salmonella controversy. Um, under the heading, Keeping Things in Proportion, it says, Statistically, you have a much greater chance of developing food poisoning whilst in hospital than from eating sandwiches from your local corner cafe. Can I pause there? Eh? Yes. Would you agree that you also stand a far greater chance of getting food poisoning from sandwiches at your local corner cafe, made with cooked meat and kept in an unrefrigerated cabinet, than you do from eating a chicken McNugget at a McDonald's restaurant? It's an awful generalisation. I it's, couldn't comment. It's a ham sandwich. Well, in Scotland, they call cook time, right? It's been left in a sandwich in an ordinary cafe on a corner, in a piece of bread with some perhaps marge or butter on it. Mr. Rampton, I'll accept your proposition. I thought that was probably so. But not all the evidence concerning food poisoning was heard in court. The key expert witness for McDonald's on this topic should have been Dr. C.F. Clark from Strathclyde University. But at the last minute, Mr. Rampton decided not to call him to give evidence. Dr. Clark's witness statement, therefore, became inadmissible evidence and couldn't be used in court. This irritated Helen Steele and Dave Morris, since this statement appeared to criticise McDonald's recommended cooking temperatures. We're on page 11. It's about the internal temperature of the patties. Mr. Clark makes a suggestion. No, my lad, he doesn't. Can you point me to it? Actually, he does. Mr. Clark recommends that 73 degrees be the internal minimum temperature of the final product and that their final temperatures were not reaching that in all cases. Their minimum was, in fact, 70. He asked them to review their time and temperature conditions applied to meat patties. This is their own expert. Both sides were at least agreed on this, that the ultimate protection against possible food poisoning from eating McDonald's hamburgers is a safe cooking temperature. McDonald's own expert had made a recommendation about a safe cooking temperature in his statement. But since the judge had accepted Dr. Clark's evidence to be inadmissible, he won't be able to take any recommendation from it into account as he considers his judgment in this case. The trial had now been in progress for almost a year and there were many more startling allegations to come. When the sewage system failed, did staff at McDonald's store of the year simply carry on cooking? I can remember on at least two occasions sewage coming up through the floor vents in the kitchen and having to be mopped out of the way while we were working. Were McDonald's managers taught to dock the wages of their staff? What the practice was, if someone had actually done 42 hours, you would write down 41 or 40. And do McDonald's have any responsibility for the destruction of the rainforests? The Javanti Indians were moved out to pave the way for cattle ranchers. Some were actually taken out by plane. It was a very wild, rough area. I saw on a crossroad somebody being killed on one of these trips. It was real far west. All this and more tomorrow night in the final rounds of the battle between Big Mac and Helen Steele and Dave Morris. Until then, good night. As Sheena said, the McLeibel trial concludes tomorrow. And that's at 7.30 here on 4. Thank you.